Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Garb August, <laughs> the worst event in BookTube history. <laughs> back and worse than ever for 2023. This is an event that was created last year by Ollie at Criminali. Of course, it took off like a bottle rocket. It's a month dedicated to reading trash. <laughs> How could that not be popular? Uh, and uh, it's back this year with twice as many hosts who've been... Uh, blackmailed into it because Ollie has all the Polaroids. <laughs> he has all the Polaroids he needs to coerce as many hosts as he has to have. Uh, and again, we are talking about trash for the month of August. And it's a great palate cleanser for me uh, when I'm reading either uh, non-trash books that are a bit demanding or sometimes a lot demanding. Oh my god. The one I read last night <laughs> doesn't get much more demanding. And I've got a monster of a demanding book on the way. I'll probably, I hope that I'll haul it on the mail haul, but it's it's going to be an undertaking. <laughs> it's going to be, and some of mine are undertakings. And then, and those are great, or not, sometimes they're boring, but uh, they are alternated with books that I read every day that are indeed trash, but they are not the good kind of trash. They're the bad kind of trash. They are boring. They are poorly done. They are pernicious. They are inept. Uh, I have to read them anyway. <laughs> but, but when those two parts of my reading are so big, naturally I want palate cleansers from time to time. And, you know, there are plenty of things that work great as palate cleansers. Quick little mysteries work great as palate, cleans as palate cleansers. Uh, Regency romances, for me, work great as palate cleansers, but so does a, a good, solid piece of trash. That will really work as a palate cleanser for me. Uh, so I just throw something on at random uh, for every night's trash reading. <laughs> and I did last night. It, it, it raises a whole bunch of questions. I'm sorry. I, I'm always the one who gets all theoretical and Jesuitical about any kind of event that I'm in. But I'm always asking questions about the events that I'm in. And I have a lot of questions about trash. Lots and lots. Lots and lots of thoughts. Lots and lots of questions. And the thing that I read last night raised a whole bunch of those questions. It was this. It's by Saul Tanpepper, and it's called Bunker 12 Contained. The breathless uh, epigraph here is, they promised to protect us, they lied. And there you have a hand reaching out from that armored door. This is an indie published book, and like a lot of books that I had, probably a hundred books, that I have acquired in the last month. This was from one of those aggregator book ebook sites services that all of you pointed me to. Uh, like Bookbub or Red Romance, Red Roses Romance, or Book Gorilla. These things that all they are is aggregator sites that show you, they send you, you give them your email, and they send you a daily email blast of the free or cheap ebooks that are on special that day. Uh, if you know of more of those sites, I want as many of those sites as I can get. I, I will try them all. Some are more successful than others, but I have found that quite a few of them are offering me a free indie book every day, if not more than one. And as, these go, they go straight, you just you click on it, you, you click buy this, it goes straight to your Kindle account, my, my, the Kindle app on my iPad here has absolutely filled up with these books. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. A lot of them are, are very professionally done. A lot of the covers are really well designed. And as I always say about indie books, I wouldn't know about these things if it weren't for going out and looking for them or for these aggregator sites sending them to me. I wouldn't know about them otherwise. They're not like commercial releases where there's, there's plenty of method to know. Right, that when if if you opt for commercial publishing, that's pretty much the only benefit that you're getting <laughs> is that, is that technically your publisher is, is implicitly guaranteeing that they will get the word out about your book. Whereas if you're an indie author, you have to do that yourself, and the inevitable result. It's not fair, but the inevitable result is that I miss a lot. We all do, but these sites help a lot. They really do. I'm sure there are more of them out there that I don't know about, uh, but. I routinely go, when I get an email like that from BookBub or Book Gorilla or whatever, uh, I open it, I scan through to see what's being offered, because if it's if it costs anything, I'm not going to click on it, obviously, because <laughs> I get I get books in the mail, and I also have the Brattle Bookshop, so if, it, if an ebook costs anything, I'm not going to click on it, 
but I do want to know what's being offered. I want to know what's out there. Classics, uh, modern classics, uh, uh, Titanic bestsellers of five years ago. I want to know what what is available because I have to figure that most people who look at those aggregator sites do not get free books in the mail and do not have the, the Brattle Bookshop. So I want to know what's available to people. If you like e-reading and you live in a book desert, those sites are going to be a godsend. But I ignore, I mean, I pay attention to what titles there are, but I don't, I don't buy anything that has a price tag on it. I, I open up those, those daily emails and look straight for the free books. And usually I buy them. I just click on them. If, if it's zero dollars, then usually I will send it over to my Kindle because I'm going to get to these things. Sooner or later, I'm going to get to all of them. So the more the merrier. I want to know what indie authors are doing. I want to know if somebody out there is writing something so good that indie author or no, I'm overjoyed that I found them so that I can make a point of reading everything they write. That, I have had so many great discoveries that way. And this book was one of those books. This was in one of those emails God knows how many weeks ago. And uh, it's YA dystopian science fiction. It's the first book in a series. So this book is called Contain, but I think the series is called Bunker 12. There are a series of bunkers, because this takes place in a world that has been ravaged by a disease called the Flens, F-L-E-N-S-E. -E. Uh, it was kind of creative. I don't know that, what's the Saul Tan Pepper? I don't know that Saul Tan Pepper knows anything about the ancient craft of whaling, <laughs> but flensing was a vital part of whaling when it was still a foremost industry in the world. It, it is a kind of thing. It's when you, it's when you use a gigantic scything knife to carve blubber off fat, or off meat. But here, it, it has a much more horrible meaning to it. The flens was an, an illness. The characters in this book don't know much about the illness. That it infects you, but you don't know you're infected right away. And it's transmitted by touch. Not by kissing or by coughing or anything like that. If you so much as touch someone, you've infected them. And you don't know that you're infected right away, but soon afterwards, a few hours later, you do know because you start to lose control of yourself and all the whites go out, all the color goes out of your eyes. Your eyes just become unrelieved black. And eventually you become ghostly pale and mindless. So the characters in this book talk about zombies as fantasy creatures, but the victims, the victims of uh, the Flints become essentially zombies. They can, they no longer register pain. They only, they only want to infect others and sometimes eat others. And they're pale, pale white and mindless and gibbering. So the, the tiny handful of survivors call them wraiths. And there's a point that's raised early on here. This is mainly the story of a young man named Finn, uh, who is the son of a man who is in charge of one of the very few survival bunkers that is known to exist. You can see why that would be true, why the, the attrition here would be merciless, because you didn't even know that it was happening. And by the time it was ha it was happening, you had no idea. Before you knew how it was transmitted, almost everyone was infected. So the, the action here picks up in this bunker, which is not Bunker 12. There's supposed to be only like 10 or 9 bunkers. It's only later in this book that a character reveals that there are in fact 12 of them. So there's the, the YA gimmick of a mythical place that you, you're, obviously your, your teenage characters are going to need to get there. Obviously there's going to be a secret contained in Bunker 12, and obviously the secret is going to be what is the nature of the Flints? How did it happen, and what is the way around it? How can we get the world back to normal once our parents have died? <laughs> Which is certainly going to happen, right? In series of this kind, either the parents are never there to start with, or they will quickly exit stage left feet first. <laughs> we get the internal human tensions of this bunker that where this story is set. The Flints ha existed three years ago. The world was pretty much overrun with wraiths. A tiny remnant of people, about 30 people, ended up in this bunker. The, it's hydroelectric. It's sealed off from the world with concrete and armored doors. And they have external monitors to watch, not only for survivors that might show up, but also for wraiths. But when the action in this book opens, wraiths haven't been seen in months. And a large, growing, vocal faction in this bunker is convinced that they're all dead. 
and that maybe everyone else in the world is dead too, and so there's really no reason for us to stay here anymore. A lot of people are getting cooped up. They're getting sick of being cooped up in this bunker with its endless rations and its very primitive tech. The bunkers were not futuristically stocked. These people have a tiny number of books, no internet, no computers, very little in the way of medical stores. Doc Cavanaugh in this book has to make do with very little. Uh, and hence no biomedical ability to, uh, to further their knowledge of the Flints. No real way to understand what happened to them. And also an end in sight. Our main character is a teenager here. He's the, uh, Saul Tanpepper doesn't go out of his way to stress this, but he's obviously a dreamboat. Uh, 18, lanky, muscular, good looking. Since there aren't many stores, he rather conveniently is wearing a t-shirt that's too tight for him. <laughs> and one of his jobs is to study the food stores, to keep a regular stock of the food stores. So he knows as well as everybody else that the bunker doesn't have food. They don't have hydroponics or anything like that. So they don't have food for more than a few years, three years. At which point, they're going to have to make a decision about the outside world anyway. Now, you can, you can imagine that in this world, if everybody has to do monitor duty in this bunker, it rotates. Everybody has to do it from uh, Finn's father, who is in control of this bunker. He's the leader. He's the only one with access codes to the doors. Uh, all the way down. Only the children are exempt from monitor duty. Uh, but you have to figure that if those three years were to pass, that would be six years in this, in this bunker. If those three years were to pass without any sight of any survivors or any wraiths, well, then... Yeah, then even the most conservative people in the bunker, which happens to be Finn's father, would say, okay, we should, we, it's probably safe to go outside. We have to anyway, but it's probably safe to go outside. Uh, and you have to figure that realistically that would happen beforehand, because you wouldn't know if you'd be able to find provisions outside. So it'd probably be two years, and then you would take what provisions you have left and go. But Finn notices early on in this book that someone is tampering with the food supply, and that it looks like they only have enough for one year not three years. And in addition to that, other things are going wrong all over the bunker, little things. Finn is, is partially distracted because it, the y, it's a YA novel. So he has a goofy best friend, Bricks, who's constantly making dated dad joke references to pop culture. I don't know when YA is going to get over this. I really don't. All sorts of things about Brangelina and whatnot. <laughs> that, that, but no kid would say it. No kid would have said it 30 years ago. It, it just really, really sticks out. Uh, but he, Finn also has a, a girlfriend, Bren, who is who he treats like a sack of crap. <laughs> it's just, that also is an absolute staple of YA science fiction, is that the female protagonist, Bren partially qualifies. She's barely a person in this book. Uh, but the female protagonist has to be treated like crap by the male protagonist. I don't know why this is. I, don't high school girls get it hard enough as it is? <laughs> but... Uh, uh, Finn notices that there are other things going wrong that ceiling fixtures or fittings seem to be coming loose or breaking down faster than they should the people in this bunker do not have the physical plant capability to fix most of what's wrong including the gigantic hydroelectric generators that are their source of life that, that keep the lights on that keep the air conditioning running that keep everything working they perfectly, they're perfectly willing to admit all of them admit it outright that if one of those were to break, they don't have any idea how to fix it. Uh, they were all brought here. They went when when the Flens was at its worst three years ago, uh, and there were there were rates everywhere, jumping out from every dark corner and consuming people. They were processed into this center by army type figures, who gave them each a, a you know an extra dose of vitamin shot and sent them on their way. So. It wasn't they weren't parsed for being specialists and they certainly weren't stocked up with specialty equipment and in such a setup you know if, if you read books like this you know right away one thing for sure is going to happen which is that something is going to show up on one of those monitors either a survivor or a wraith or both something is certainly going to show up in the first 40 pages the plot is going to be motored at least a little by that. But something else does too. These, these increasing deteriorations in the bunker look planned. They look artificial. They look like someone's doing this. 
and at one point, uh, Finn is noticing that, that it feels really hot while he's sitting, while he's inventorying the food, and every, a bunch of other uh, uh, people show up and notice that as well, and realize that uh, there's been a steam leak, that one of the steam trunks is is leaking steam and looks like it could blow at any minute, and they need to get in and fix it. And one of them does. One of them rushes past Finn and goes into the room as it breaks, and Finn hears the man scream as he is scalded from head to toe. Second degree burns over all of his body by that steam. He's hauled out of the room, and the pipe is shut off and fixed. But Finn has seen this guy. He, he, he saw him as he was being pulled out of the room, and he knows that he can't live. They don't have any medical supplies to speak of. I mean, barely anything. They certainly don't have what he would need, which would be abrasion, antibiotics, uh, IV fluids, skin grafts maybe, ideally, something like that. They don't have anything like that. They, he's just going to die. The, the, his, his burns are, at the very least, if they don't kill him outright, they're going to get infected and he's going to die. And he is kept quarantined by Dr. Cavanaugh. She doesn't want anybody to see him, obviously, because it would be traumatic. He has a daughter right there on the station, and everybody knows everybody. It's only 30-something people. Uh, this crystallizes in Finn's mind the idea that sabotage is being worked here, maybe to undermine his father, maybe by the faction that wants to open the doors and go outside. Finn's father absolutely refuses to give these door codes. He absolutely refuses to have that happen. Uh, are we going to get post-apocalyptic? Oh, no, we're not. Okay, well... <laughs> Uh, eventually we see that faction and Saul Tanpepper does a pretty good job of making all the factions and all the people seem believable the the bully the, the teenager the other there are a bunch of teenagers here and the the one who is constantly bullying Finn and Bricks and and whatnot uh, he is a bit of a lout but he is a person and his father is a bit of a lout and also a person and is the leader of the opposition, the, the leader of the people who wants to open the doors and leave. And that is all coming to a head when, sure enough, on the monitor, a survivor shows up. A man shows up. Who is really nervous and wants to talk to people inside this facility. He wants to go into the facility and talk to them. But his nervousness is not what you expect. It's, in fact, the reverse of what you expect. Because he's not worried about contaminating them. He's worried about them contaminating him. He's the one who mentions Bunker 12. But he seems like he's more cautious about getting something from them than giving something to them. Because of course, they're all wondering, you know, is he carrying the plants? Is it, has it mutated? So maybe it doesn't work right away, but he'll infect us all. Or is he maybe being chased by wraiths? And if we, if we let him in, we'll lead all of them straight to our door. Uh, that is a little bit of a left curve, and it goes hand-in-hand hand with the other left curve that strikes right at the beginning of this book, so I'm not spoiling anything, which is that the man who was scalded from head to toe, uh, the, Dr. Kavanaugh and Finn's father are trying to hide this fact from everybody else in the bunker, but he's recovering. And he's recovering remarkably quickly. <laughs> he is regenerating. And he is not regenerating into anything human. He still talks... He still quips. He knows who he was. He still identifies everyone by name. But he doesn't even look human anymore. And he's obviously going to become something that isn't human at all. So what does that have to do with any of this? What does that have to do with Wraiths or the Flints or Bunker 12 or anything? You get into this book and you start to wonder all of those things. And I did too. I did too. And by the halfway point in this book, I was well and truly involved in the plot, but I was also, as is true with YA dystopian fiction, I was making my predictions. I was predicting a whole bunch of things. And uh, they all came true. And yours were too. They're easy. It, this is a very, very predictable book. And partly that is probably by design, right? I mean, this is done on a template. And several examples of that template have gone on to earn their authors squintillions of dollars. <laughs> this, is, this is done on a template. Uh, it very much felt that way. It was done with energy. Uh, I liked the complexity of the fact that there, we don't really get any out-and-out -out villains, any out-and-out -out good guys. The Finn's relations with his father are anything but pleasant. Uh, and his, like I mentioned, his relationship with his poor girlfriend is mostly him shrugging her off when she wants to cuddle with him. <laughs> That's no way to repopulate the species. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, yes, your reaction to his goofy best friend with his 80s dad jokes will be homicidal. But the best friend is not homicidal. <laughs> so inside the book's reality, there's, there's a good deal of complexity here. Uh, some, anyway. But uh, not only is it completely predictable, but also it has the same that same weirdness that all YA dystopians have, which is that the fate of humanity is at stake and huge amounts of space are given over to uh, smells like teen spirit, <laughs> to, to teens zooming each other or wanting to or mooning over each other or I can't believe you held his hand or I can't believe you took his side or whatnot. There shouldn't be any scenes like that in <laughs> anything like this or maybe a tiny little bit. If you've got a big plot, I mean, I know that's part of the template is to put high school romances at the heart of a world enveloping story. It underscores the teenage delusion at the heart of sci-fi dystopia, which is that sci-fi romances are important or matter at all. They don't at all. But to the teenagers involved, they are literally everything. The fate of the world is hanging on whether or not, you know, Raimondo notices that you that you brought him his lunch or whatnot. Uh, so the predictability was one thing, and also that unbalance, which has always bothered me in these kinds of books. That has always bothered me. And it's all through here. And I read this book. I'm glad that I did. I might look out for the others. I would not pay for them, but I would, I, if one of them came up free on one of these daily reminder things, I would probably do it and continue on with this story. There are a lot of things that are left hanging in this book, so if this sort of thing interests you, you will definitely want to move on to the next book. It wasn't ineptly done at all. So why am I talking about it for Garb August? Well, that was one of the things, one of the questions, one of the meta questions, one of the Jesuitical questions that came to my mind is, you know, again, what are we talking about when we talk about garbage? <laughs> is is something that is, I mean, the, I don't know this author at all, and I don't mean any ill will. I'm a big fan of indie authors. But if I had to use a word to describe this, a term to describe this book, it would be run of the mill. Is that trash? I don't know. I wonder here about my own viewpoint. Uh, and that makes me wonder about the sliding scale of trash just in general. You have a job. You have responsibilities. You have family. You have friends. You have loved ones. You have children. You have classes. You have a ton of things pulling and dragging at your time. You are, you're a booktube, so you make time to read, but it's not much time. Surely, surely that can make you a little harsher towards things that are run-of-the-mill. Would you have read this with all those, it, using that very precious reading time, with all those things pulling for your attention, would you have read this to the end and thought, that stunk? Not because it really did, but because it wasn't at all good enough to warrant your attention. I don't know. And if that's true, then does that make this trash? I don't I think this was trash. It was done with heart. It was done with energy. It was a little bit on the boring side and very much uh, according to a template. I think if I were putting on my pedagogical hat, I would say that ta Saul Tanpepper should have worked this a little harder. And that if he knows that himself and decided not to, well, that's awful mercenary. That's a kind of cynicism that deserves to be condemned. If you're writing a book to make money, instead of because you want to. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. This was nothing to write home about. It's not anywhere close. It's not in the same galaxy as anything that would ever make my year-end list. I don't know that it was trash, though. It's, it's efficiently done for what it wants to be. I think what I will do to help me clarify these thoughts is to pick another book from one of those aggregator sites tonight. I'll pick another one of these indie things. And just go through it. Lord knows, I have read some indie books that were god awful. This is not that. This is this is not that. So what is this? On on the spectrum of trash, what is this? I don't I don't know. Uh, if you're if you've got a huge sweet tooth for this kind of disease slash zombie post apocalyptic thing, if you love these kinds of things, you will not find this a waste of time. I don't think you will, provided you can put up with all the YA stuff because all of the YA stuff is in here all of it is the bullying the dad jokes the outdated humor the mistreated girlfriend 
the inadvertently hunky main character, the functional absence of parents after a certain point, the, the mythical destination point that will explain everything and that will inevitably have horrible a-hole parent, uh, adults in lab coats, <laughs> inevitably. Uh, if, you're, if you can withstand all that, in fact, if you maybe cut your teeth on reading with Divergent or things like it and you like that sort of thing, you're going to get plenty of it in this book. Uh, I just don't know if it's trash. I don't know if it is. Hmm. Is the average trash? Can trash be average? I don't know. I don't know. I will continue to ponder, but you'll be very happy to hear that the rest of my pondering I will do off camera. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for today. I will see you next time. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.